One of the most terrifying scenarios is finding yourself inside a submarine that is sinking uncontrollably. At great depths, the increasing water pressure can cause the vessel to implode. When I learned what really happens when a submarine or any submersible reaches its maximum operating depth, also known as crush depth, I was truly shocked. How is it possible to estimate the depth of a submarine's implosion based on the sound it makes? Why is it highly unlikely to recover the bodies of those on board? How was the crew of a sunken submarine once rescued from the ocean floor? And why has no one ever actually experienced the implosion of a submarine? The answers to these questions might surprise you this is not what you think. On November 15, 2017, the Argentinian submarine A.R. A San Juan disappeared off the coast of Argentina. About a week later, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization released a report revealing that they had detected a hydroacoustic anomaly about 30 nautical miles from the submarine's last known position. This anomaly, occurring hours after the sub's final contact, was believed to be caused by the collapse of AR. A San Juan's pressure hull. The report also mentioned the depth of the implosion, which intrigued me. How could they determine the depth of the collapse when it happened well before the submarine could reach the ocean floor? The answer lies in the bubble pulse effect. When a submarine implodes, a gas bubble forms and oscillates, creating a detectable acoustic pulse. By measuring the frequency of this pulse, which was 4.4 hz in this case, and knowing the volume of air in the submarine, experts calculated that the implosion occurred at a depth of 1,275 feet underwater. The depth value derived from the acoustic signal can be used to estimate the energy required to produce that frequency at that depth. For AER, a San Juan, the collapse released an energy equivalent to 12,500 pounds of TENT. The surrounding water pressure was 570 PE less. I and the submarine hull would have crumpled at over 1500 miles per hour. While this sounds terrifying, no one has ever truly experienced it. Tragically, many have lost their lives in such accidents, but they wouldn't have had time to feel or comprehend the implosion. Human brains typically experience pain with a delay. It takes about 100 milliseconds to 2 seconds for the brain to process pain sensations, depending on the type of pain. In the case of AR, a San Juan, the pressure hull was destroyed in less than 40 milliseconds much too fast for anyone on board to consciously experience anything, including pain. The crew's deaths would have been almost instantaneous. When it comes to recovering the bodies of those on board a sunken submarine, it's virtually impossible. The collapse of a submarine's pressure hull is somewhat similar to how a diesel engine functions, where compressing air and fuel causes auto-ignition. Inside the submarine, high concentrations of hydrocarbon vapors from substances like hydraulic oil, diesel fuel, grease, and rubber can build up. When the hull collapses, it's like a massive piston compressing the air, potentially causing it to ignite. Even if ignition doesn't occur, the extreme compression generates intense heat, the implosion and the subsequent oscillations from the bubble pulse effect make body recovery unfeasible. However, there have been rare cases where crew members have survived being trapped in a sunken submarine. For depths up to 600 feet, special submarine escape suits can help crew members reach the surface through an escape hatch or torpedo tube. This ascent takes just three to four minutes, but it's a harrowing ordeal marked by panic, oxygen narcosis, and potential eardrum damage. When a submarine is too deep for an escape suit, your only chance of survival would be to use a submersible rescue vehicle, like the Russian Priyaz class vessel. This titanium-hulled vehicle can rescue up to 16 people from depths of up to 3,200 feet. Some submarines, like the Russian Typhoon class, are equipped with an escape pod, but these pods have proven unreliable in real emergencies. One notable but tragic rescue attempt was for the Russian Kursk nuclear submarine. Several submersible rescue vehicles were deployed, but the mission failed because the Priyaz class vessel could not dock with the stranded submarine. This illustrates the extreme difficulties of submarine rescue operations, making the rescue of the UPS Esquelus a near miracle. In May 1939, during its 19th test dive, 
the USS Guayla sank to the ocean floor 243 feet below the surface due to a malfunction that opened the main air induction valve when it was only 60 feet underwater. Flooding quickly took out the aft torpedo room, engine rooms, and crew's quarters. The crew sealed themselves in compartments with enough air to last up to 48 hours. Isolated and unable to communicate, the crew released a boy with a telephone in hopes that rescuers would find it. At the time, no rescue mission had ever succeeded at depths beyond 40 feet. Yet, despite the daunting odds, the crew of the Squalus waited, and their eventual rescue remains a remarkable feat of bravery and engineering. Sometime after the U.S. Squalus sank, the boy it had released was spotted by their sister submarine, the Sculpin. The two commanders managed to exchange a few words, but an ocean swell caused the line to snap, cutting off communication. Within 24 hours, rescue ships arrived with an experimental device, a rescue bell. A hard hat diver had to first prepare and descend, attaching a downhole cable from a winch inside the bell. The bell was then lowered into the water and positioned precisely above the hatch of the sunken submarine. The crew of the Squalus, trapped on the ocean floor, was overjoyed to see the rescuers. Seven sailors climbed into the bell and were brought to the surface, with three more trips required to rescue all 33 men. After the successful rescue, the US Navy spent another 113 days salvaging the submarine. They used pontoons to lift the wreck from the ocean floor by first filling the pontoons with water for negative buoyancy, then pumping air into them to make them buoyant. The first attempt failed when the bow rose too quickly, but eventually, the Squalus was towed back to port on September 13, 1939. Twenty-five bodies were recovered from the wreckage, but the body of the 26th victim was never found. In less than a year, the U.T.S. Squalus was repaired and recommissioned as the U.T.S. Sailfish, serving in World War II. The crew was forbidden from mentioning Squalus while aboard the Sailfish. After decommissioning in 1945, the conning tower was preserved and placed in a park at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, where memorial ceremonies are held every May. In contrast, the Titan submersible, lost on June 18, 2023, during an expedition to the RMS Titanic wreck, imploded at a depth nearly 10 times greater than that of ARA San Juan, facing 10 times the water pressure. While we can never know the exact thoughts of the five Titan crew members in their final moments, it's possible that their last experiences were filled with awe and excitement, rather than fear. While the thought of a submarine implosion is terrifying, it also highlights the incredible engineering that goes into making these vessels safe. Thanks for joining us on this deep sea exploration. If you found this video intriguing, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more fascinating deep sea mysteries. And remember, stay curious and stay safe.